this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. It being 2 p.m., questions without notice. Senator Wong. Oh, sorry, Senator Birmingham, seeking the call. My apologies. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a statement regarding ministerial absences. Leave is granted. Thank you, Mr. President. I advise the Senate that Senator Reynolds will be absent from question time today, Thursday, 10 December 2020, due to ministerial business. In Senator Reynolds' absence, I will represent the Minister for Education and the Minister for Decentralisation and Regional Education in respect of regional education. Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Defence, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, the Minister for Defence Personnel, the Assistant Defence Minister and the Minister for Defence Industry. Senator Cash will represent the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts. Senator Wong. Order. My question is that. Oh, sorry. Did you call me, Mr. President? I did, President? Senator Wong. <laughs> Senator Wong. The call is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. My, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Why did Mr. Morrison and his ministers have to be asked six times in the House in question time yesterday, uh, over this week, before finally telling the truth? and admitting that their own legislation will enable cuts to the take-home pay of workers. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Wong uh, for her question. I can't, uh, can't say that, uh, that I have been in the House of Representatives question time this week, and nor have I uh, reviewed the sequence of questions that, uh, that were asked there. So, uh, so, so Senator, Senator Wong, uh, your question relates obviously to uh, the types of reforms to industrial relations that our government has outlined, uh, reforms that build upon the pillars of our economic recovery plan in response to the COVID-19 global pandemic and the shockwaves that are sent across the global economy and our own. And although our economy has withstood those shockwaves far better than most of the rest of the world in seeing businesses survive that elsewhere would not have survived, in seeing jobs survive that elsewhere would not have survived, we still face challenges in terms of that economic recovery. And to make sure that we do get the continued growth in jobs that we have enjoyed that has brought us to this stage of the comeback from COVID-19, we are making sure that through the budget we deliver in relation to growth and investment, to make sure that Australians, through our tax reforms, have got more money to spend, to make sure that businesses have got more incentive to invest and to make Order sure that there is confidence, confidence to employ Senate, as well. Senator Ayres. And our approach right through this pandemic has been to be one of engagement and consultation with, with the states and territories, be it, with, be it with business or the trade union movement. And we welcome and thank the cooperation that has been shown through the different stages of the pandemic, Mr President. We equally welcome the fact that in relation to reform of the IR system or looking forward, there was a very lengthy consultation process bringing together the different groups for over 180 hours of discussions held as part of those industrial relations discussions, all of which designed to try to get collaboration Order. and Senator consultation around the, the pathway has forward. Inspired. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Well, uh, my supplementary is to give the minister a second chance to be honest with working families <laughs> and admit that the government's new laws enable cuts to take-home pay at the end of one of the hardest years in the lives of so many Australians. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the reforms we're putting in place, first and foremost, are about getting more Australians into jobs. Yeah. Australians have the best chance of having the best pay packet when they are in a job when there are more Australians in jobs and when we see growth in the jobs market. In terms of Australians being better off, Mr President, employees in casual work wanting to transition to part-time or full-time work will be better off under the reforms order. that we are Senator proposing. Wong on a point of order. Thank you, Mr President. I asked both in the primary and in the first supplementary, I asked about cuts to take-home pay. I ask the minister to be directly relevant to that question. Um, you, you, both of your questions, Senator Wong, did have some politically loaded phrases in them. The minister, in my view, can't be instructed to answer a part of the question. He is talking about the specific policy and package of bills, and I do consider that to be directly relevant uh, because he's talking about the government's policy and not anything else. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. In relation to Australians in jobs being better off, as I was saying, those in casual work wanting to transition to greater levels of permanency will be better off under our reforms. Those part-time employees wanting more hours of work in key industries will be better off. 
employees being worried about being underpaid will be better off under the reforms that we have outlined. Employees working in significant order. Greenfields Senator, projects. Well, I want a point of order. Cuts to take-home pay. Um, That's the I'll question. Senator direct Wong. relevance. Um, the minister Why is being the directly truth, relevant. Sir? Senator Birmingham. Mr. Mr. Mr President, Order. we are making Senator, sure Senator that Australians Wong. will be better off because there will be more incentive Senator for Wong. more jobs. With more Senator jobs, Pratt, you've got Senator more Wong. opportunities for Australians to succeed and to get ahead. Order. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Despite repeatedly denying its legislation permits the take-home pay of working families to be cut before finally conceding it will, Earlier this afternoon, Mr Porter said of his legislation, and I quote, there's plenty to keep everyone interested and alert. What else in this government's reforms under Mr Morrison should workers be alert to? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. Well, I would be interested to have time to go and look at the transcript of Mr Porter's remarks. I'm sure, I'm sure Mr Porter was probably being asked about something like the Senate inquiry that may well occur, of which I have no doubt that those opposite will run a scare campaign, as they already are, every step of the way in relation to the consideration Senator of this Wong. legislation. They, I know that they can't help themselves in terms of wanting to run a scare campaign. Senator they can't Watt. help themselves. They will opt Senator for Watt. negativity. They will opt for scare. They will opt, of course, for mistruths and misleading at every step of the way. Now, we are quite Order. happy, having gone through an exhaustive consultation process in this legislation, to now submit it to the scrutiny of the parliament, to have the extensive Senate inquiry and to give the opportunity for those who want to find points of interest in the bills to be able to debate them through that Senate inquiry and for the facts to shine through. Because the facts will show these reforms will be good for Australian businesses, good for employment and create more jobs for more Australians. Order. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government has stood alongside Australians through the challenges our nation has faced this year? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Senator Mr. Ayers. President. Mr. President, Senator Australia Ayers, and the world has faced a year like none other. And I thank Senator Patterson for his question, because indeed we are indebted and grateful to all Australians for all that they have done this year as the nation has stood together in response to the biggest economic shock since the Great Depression in the face of a once-in-a-century global pandemic. Australians have demonstrated their resilience and they should be congratulated and thanked for the efforts that they have made, the sort of resolve and spirit our country has been built upon. Indeed, all levels of Australia have been challenged, including governments, and we have worked to stand alongside Australians in terms of the actions we've taken to save lives and livelihoods across our country. We quickly closed our international borders when the threats were evident that the transmission of COVID would most likely spread through those international transactions of individuals. We put health measures in place to suppress the spread of the virus. Our first aim was, and still is, to keep Australians safe. We then, of course, Mr President, in recognising the impacts of those measures to keep Australians safe, worked hard to cushion the inevitable economic blow that would follow. We put in place, most notably, the JobKeeper program, the single largest support measure ever introduced by an Australian government. We created JobKeeper, we have extended it and transitioned it in ways to keep Australians safe and secure in their livelihoods. The Reserve, Bank, the Reserve Bank has indicated and assessed that JobKeeper helped to save 700,000 Australian jobs. Our measures have, throughout the course of this year, provided the best opportunity for Australians to have their lives protected, their livelihoods protected and to put us in the strongest possible position for the future. Order. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister. Can you outline how our economic comeback from the COVID-19 pandemic is building in momentum? Order. 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 Senator Wong, I know it's the last question time. Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, Mr. President. Well, we do have strong data coming through to show that although there is a tough road that is still ahead, the economic comeback in Australia is well and truly underway. We know that the recovery has some way to go and that we face many global headwinds. But indeed, the consumer confidence has once again surged to its highest level in a decade, Mr. President. Consumer confidence at its highest level in a decade. When Westpac's monthly index jumped 4.1 per cent, their chief economist Bill Evans said after only eight months, the evidence seems clear that sentiment has fully recovered from the COVID recession. Now that's only sentiment, Mr. President. We acknowledge the work is in continuing the strong jobs growth uh, that we have seen to date and to make sure that we get Australians back into more jobs. That's what our budget is built around. It's what our policies are built around to maintain that, whilst, of course, also seeing Australia's AAA credit rating reaffirmed and the support to make sure that we Order. have that growth Senator across Birmingham. the economy. Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is the Morrison government's focus on creating jobs paying off for Australian workers and the Australian economy? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the growth in jobs and employment is encouraging. There is, as I've stressed, a way to go. But over the last five months, almost 650,000 jobs have been created, including 334,000 jobs of Australian women and 226,000 jobs of young Australians. The effective unemployment rate has come down from a peak of 14.9 per cent to 7.4 per cent, whilst Mr. President, the participation rate in the workforce is at 65.8 per cent and approaching its pre-crisis level. Australia's strength as we entered this pandemic was indeed the fact that we had record levels of employment alongside record levels of workforce participation. We had managed to create resilience in the Australian economy and, pleasingly, we have seen that resilience see us through these tough times. By global comparisons, Australians can hold their heads high at the way in which we have managed together to keep Australians safe and secure this year. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In an article in this morning's Australian Financial Review entitled Porter Retreats in Union Brawl, it is reported that the Morrison government may amend or even dump provisions of its Industrial Relations Bill. Is the government persisting with its attempt to cut the take-home pay of Australian working families? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Mr President, that is absolutely not the intent, the purpose or will be the result of the government's reforms. The government is implementing these reforms, as I have said already time and time again in this place, to create the best environment for jobs and employment growth to continue strongly in this country. Mr President, we've seen some 80 per cent of jobs that were lost or had hours reduced due to the pandemic have been regained to date. But that still shows there's work to go in other ways. We also know from the fact that the cooperation that occurred during the pandemic that there are opportunities for efficiencies and improvements to occur in our industrial relations environment and workplace relations space. That's what these changes seek to do. They seek to ensure that we get practical improvements to the way in which the workplace relations system works. And in terms of those practical improvements, we expect to see real gains for businesses and employees. Without business success, there is no employment success, Mr President. That is a key point that is fundamental to everything about job creation in this country. Without business success, there is no job success. So we have to make sure our businesses are successful that's what our investments, be they in infrastructure, in skills, in tax reforms and incentives, are all about creating the environment for jobs growth. These reforms are about creating the environment for jobs growth as well, reforms to create more jobs so that any worker ultimately wanting a job will be better off as a result of them. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Senator Stoker said in her first speech, and I quote, Industrial relations reform is something our nation desperately needs and which the conservative side of politics should promote. Does Senator Stoker support the retreat floated in this morning's papers? Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, sir. Thank, thank, thanks, Mr. President. Well, um, of course, Senator Stoker gave a fine first speech, as I uh, as I recall, and I uh, and I again congratulate her on that and many fine contributions since. And of course, Mr. President, Mr. President, uh, uh, in terms of those arguing for these types of reforms, why don't those opposite listen Order. to small business? To small business, Order, the Watt. Council of Small Business Organisations, who have said Senator very McAllister. clearly that the types of reforms we're Senator proposing Watt. are about managing your business and everything else Watt. in the agreement no, so you can survive. If you're a no, worker, him. you'd rather have a job. And small business are, of course, committed to trying to create those jobs, and we are committed. We are committed to delivering those jobs. Now, it says it all that those opposite in their scare campaign have already resorted to anonymous newspaper stories and, uh, and not even bothering to look, not even bothering to look, of course, at the legislation, the Order. details Senator and the fact they are the sensible, measured expired. Order. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, Mr Jason Falinski, Mr Tim Wilson and Senator Bragg have advocated for the Greater Industrial Relations Flexibility, jointly authoring a opt-ed and lobbying within the coalition. Do coalition backbenchers support the retreat by the Morrison government flagged in this morning's papers? Senator Birmingham. So, 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 Mr. President, it's 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 hard sometimes, I know, to follow the strategy of those opposite. Uh, indeed, the Australian people have found it hard in recent elections to follow the strategy of those opposite. But, mis, but, mis, but, Mr. President, I seem to have had the first series of questions from those opposite I was asked today, suggesting that the reforms were too harsh. And now Senator Gallagher's based all of his questions around whether we've backed down and the reforms aren't harsh enough or something. Now, these reforms, these reforms are sensible, thoughtful reforms based on extensive, order. lengthy consultation. Senator, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Direct relevance. The minister said questions whether or not there's been a backdown. We, we invite him to tell his coalition Senator colleagues Wong, if there's been no a retreat order, or not. That is Have no point of order, Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Now, 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 Mr. President, I don't know whether there's a split over there, whether Senator Gallagher is actually arguing that there should be further reforms that ought to be in this package or not. But I can assure him, and I can assure every other senator and every Australian, these reforms are the result of hours upon hours of work and consultation between the government, between the union movement, between businesses in seeking to find sensible Order. approaches to create a more secure employment inspired. environment. Senator Rice. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister Payne. On the 8th of December, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Niels Meltzer, appealed to British authorities to immediately release Julian Assange from prison or to place him under guarded house arrest during U US extradition proceedings. Minister, today is Order. International Human Rights Day. Will the minister join this call from the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture in calling for Mr Assange's human rights to be protected? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank Senator Rice uh, for her question. I haven't specifically heard about uh, Mr Meltzer's uh, call today, uh, but I have previously said that uh, the government rejects any suggestion by the uh, UN Special Rapporteur uh, that the government is complicit uh, in uh, alleged psychological torture or has shown a lack of consular support for Mr Assange. Uh, as far as uh, I understand and am, and, am, and am advised, the Special Rapporteur has not been in contact with the Australian government to raise these concerns directly. I have specifically raised the situation of Mr Assange and his conditions previously uh, with senior British officials. Uh, and I am ensure, assured that his uh, circumstances uh, are appropriate and uh, humane. Senator Rice, a supplementary question. Thanks, Minister. Um, Minister, I acknowledge your diplomatic and political work to secure the release of Kylie Moore Gilbert and note that these efforts went well beyond consular assistance. Here, here. Will the Minister recognise that Mr Assange's case, situation is not simply a consular case and offer the same diplomatic and political support 
to secure his release. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I don't uh, believe it is possible to directly equate uh, cases such as these uh, in the consular context or, in fact, in the legal context, Mr. President. Currently, Mr. Assange's extradition case is adjourned until the 4th of January next year, when uh, Her Honour will hand down her decision. I'm not going to provide a running commentary on those legal proceedings, but the Australian government continues to monitor Mr. Assange's case closely, as we do for Australians in detention overseas. Uh, as I previously advised the senator in the context of uh, estimates, Mr. President, consular officers have attended his extradition. Order, and Senator Rice, questions. on a point of order. Thank you. A point of order with regards to relevance. My question was very simple. Will the minister recognise that Mr. Assange's situation no, senator, is not simply a consular case? Senator Rice, case? Um, again, I say to senators, you can't simply get up and say, repeat part of a question without making a point as to how the answer is not relevant to all of the questions. Senator Payne was being directly relevant to the question at that point, talking about the assistance being provided, Senator Rice. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Qu Mr. President. Uh, I was going to add to my answer that consular staff uh, have had uh, discussions with uh, Her Majesty's Prison Belmarsh authorities. They are assured that Mr Assange has access to the care that he uh, needs. Uh, due to privacy considerations that we extend uh, to all consular clients, I am not able to disclose any further information relating to Mr Assange. Senator Rice, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you. Um, Minister, 65 of approximately 160 inmates in Belmarsh Prison have tested positive for COVID putting Mr Assange at serious risk. Will you make representations, you personally make representations for his transfer to house arrest for the duration of the extradition proceedings to protect his health and his human rights? Today is International Human Rights Day. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr Assange has withdrawn consent for the Australian government to consult about his personal circumstances, his health and his welfare in prison. Mr Assange withdrew that uh, consent on 13 June last year. We have raised on a number of occasions with the United Kingdom government and with prison officials our expectations on how he would be treated. Uh, the High Commissioner in the United Kingdom has received direct assurances that Mr Assange is held in appropriate conditions with access to a full prison regime of medical support and access to legal advice, noting prison COVID-19 social Rice distancing. On a point of order. Yes, thanks, Mr President. Again, my question was whether the minister would Senator make Rice. personal Senator Rice. Senator Rice, resume your seat. Resume your seat. You can't stand up and simply repeat a question. What is the point of order, Senator Rice? Was relevance. My question was, would the minister no, make that, personal that, that, sit down, representation? Senator Rice. Not even <laughs> Senator Payne was being directly relevant to the answer. Directly relevant. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. Let me conclude by saying that the High Commission has written to Mr Assange 18 times offering consular support since that was with, since his agreement was Order. withdrawn on the 13th of June Order, last year. Senator Wish Wilson. Most recent time was the 8th of December. Senator Wish we Wilson. have not received a response from Mr Assange or his legal team Senator to Payne, any time one for the of those has 18 expired. Sen Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. It concerns the recent signing of a memorandum of understanding between the government of Papua New Guinea, the Fly River Provincial Government, the China Fujian Zhonghong uh, Fisheries Company for the construction of a $200 million multifunction fishery industrial park on the island of uh, Daru in close proximity to the Torres Strait. Did the PNG government consult with the Australian government prior to entering into this agreement, which was announced by the Chinese Ministry of Commerce? and strongly backed by the Chinese ambassador in Port Moresby. What views has the Australian government expressed to PNG about, about this project? What are the national security uh, implications of Australia of a permanent Chinese fishing present next to the Torres Strait? Is it not the case that such a presence, presence will complicate our uh, security and provide China with a new foothold for interference in PNG? 
The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Patrick for his question and some uh, advance, uh, brief advance notice of his, uh, the nature of his question. Uh, I am aware, Mr. President, of a memorandum of understanding uh, being signed on the 13th of November this year between Papua New Guinea's Western Province Provincial Government, uh, the Chinese Fishing Company, Fujian Zhonghong Fishery Limited, and the Papua New Guinea National Fisheries Authority. Mr. President, while bilateral matters are, of course, uh, bilateral arrangements are, of course, a matter for the respective countries, we are in contact with the Papua New Guinea government on the reported memorandum of understanding, in particular to ensure that the full range of Australian interests, including in fisheries protection, are fully safeguarded. We are highly trusted partners, Australia and Papua New Guinea, as demonstrated in the signing of our comprehensive strategic and economic partnership uh, just on the 5th of August. Even in the context of COVID-19, Mr President, we were able to implement that CSEP. So we have the closest of relationships at both the political and the operational levels. I would advise the Chamber that uh, it is our view there is some way to go before any material activity commences in relation to this MOU. Normal monitoring and enforcement actions by Australian authorities continue to operate to particularly protect our fisheries. We expect all fishers in the Torres Strait region to follow respective Australian and Papua New Guinea laws uh, and international obligations. Our engagement in the Pacific, Mr President, is driven by our commitment to the shared Blue Pacific vision of a secure, stable, inclusive and prosperous region. It is Australia's view that all external partners must respect our region's collective security interests. Uh, we make that clear in our engagement and we expect others to do the same. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Minister. What are the implications for the operation of the Torres, Torres Strait Treaty, especially the treaty's provisions relating to fishing activities li likely to arise from a large Chinese maritime facility at Daru, including the potential operation of Chinese-controlled fishing vessels under the PNG flag in the Torres Strait, given that the Chinese fishing fleets are well, have a well-known tendency for over-exploitation of marine resources? How will Australia protect the marine ecosystem of the Torres Strait from their depredations? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. I think that is a good question, and there will be more work to do on this matter, clearly, as uh, we uh, seek to understand more in relation to the uh, details of the memorandum of, uh, of understanding between uh, those organisations and uh, the Papua New Guinea government. Uh, but I would um, advise the Chamber that the Australian Border Force has an ongoing presence in the Torres Strait, has a very close working relationship with law enforcement agencies and with our Papua New Guinea counterparts. Commercial scale fisheries, Mr President, would not be considered a traditional activity under the Torres Strait Treaty and would not be permitted. Uh, only residents of the protected zone are able to undertake such activities, uh, which is intended to protect the air, the sea, the land of the Torres Strait, uh, including the native plant and animal life, including the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna, the CITES, such as dugong and turtles. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given Australia's status as PNG's top aid donor, with $596 million in assistance in 2020-2021, and our close bilateral ties, including our support for PNG's response to the COVID-19 crisis, will the Australian government press PNG to be mindful of our national security concerns in relation to China? Will the government propose to PNG any specific alternatives to replace the proposed fishing vessel projects at Daru? Senator Payne. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. There's a number of issues in, in Senator Patrick's question, but the first thing I would, re would reiterate is the closeness of the australia Papua New Guinea partnership, manifested uh, literally in uh, August uh, of this year by the signing of a comprehensive strategic and economic partnership. That shows, that says that we have the closest of relationships at the political and operational level. Uh, as I said, there's a number of aspects to, uh, to Senator Patrick's question, but one thing I would like to draw the attention of the Chamber to is the work that we are particularly doing in Western Province, uh, for example, to address their health and uh, development challenges, including through our investment in the Mabadawan Health Centre in, and in food and in water security. We will continue to support Papua New Guinea's uh, recovery, both in health and economic terms, from COVID-19. We have a number of programs in relation to water, in relation to food security uh, and in relation to sanitation, which are very important to the recovery and the continue, strong continuation of the region. And we will work Order. closely with our Senator partners Payne. on this. Senator Van. 
Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Could the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government has kept Australians in jobs and supported Australian businesses through the unprecedented labour market challenges of 2020? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Van for his question. And Mr President, as 2020 uh, draws to a close, I would just like to thank all of the small and family businesses out there, uh, the almost 3.5 million of them that employ almost 6 million Australians each and every day for everything that they have done uh, in what has been an incredibly challenging year for them, a year like no other. Uh, but more than that, a year that they could never have predicted. Uh, this year, as we all know, Australia and Australians, they have been tested like never before. Lives and livelihoods have been lost, and many Australians, including those small and family businesses, through no fault of their own, through no fault of their own, they are doing it tough. COVID-19 has, without a doubt, had a devastating impact on the Australian economy. But where we look, when we look at where we were, before COVID-19 hit. We've actually ended COVID-19, and in particular when you look at the labour market, from a position of economic strength. And again, that is because of the hard work and dedication of our family businesses, our small businesses out there. In February 2020, Australia had a record number of people in employment. 13 million Australians were in employment. This included a record number of women in employment. It included a record number of Australians in full-time work, and it included more than 1.9 million youth in employment. When we came to office in 2013, we said that we would be a job-creating government. We would put in place the economic framework that would allow businesses to prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. And since we were elected to office, we have now overseen the creation of 1.5 million jobs and, Mr President, full-time employment has accounted for around 57 per cent of total jobs growth over that period. But we acknowledge governments don't create jobs. We put in place a policy framework. And to all of those businesses out there, small and family in particular, we Order. say Senator thank Senator Cash. You. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how has the Morrison government delivered record economic support to help Australians through this unprecedented crisis and to stay connected to jobs? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as you know, to protect the health of Australians, tough decisions had to be made by the government. Uh, and part of those decisions were to close down parts of our economy. And what did that mean? It meant that businesses, through no fault of their own, had to close their doors. And as a result, uh, many jobs across Australia were lost. But what we did as a government was that we moved quickly and we moved decisively to put in place record economic support to support the economy and households to get through COVID-19. Uh, and as the Leader of the Government has already stated today, this included JobKeeper, JobSeeker, the cash flow boost, the SME guarantee scheme uh, and early withdrawal of superannuation. We put in place a suite of policies uh, that businesses and Australians uh, were able to look at to see what suited them. As a result of these measures, Mr President, we have now seen 648,500 jobs return in the last five months. And again, we thank those businesses out there who are doing the right thing by Australians Order, and Cash. giving them a job. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you. As the world looks forward to a 2021, is the minister aware of any signs of recovery from the setbacks of the coronavirus? And what is the government doing to support this comeback? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, in terms of the policies that we put in place. What they have done is ensure that businesses have been able to reopen their doors and, in many cases, keep them open, but also get Australians back into jobs. So when we look at the national effective unemployment rate, it has fallen to 7.4 per cent from 14.9 per cent. Almost 75 per cent of those who had lost their jobs as a result of COVID-19 are, are back at work. And certainly, there are encouragingly signs of recovery. The OECD they have upgraded Australia's economic growth outlook by 0.3 per cent, confirming our economic recovery is underway. The OECD has also emphasised the Morrison government's economic response to the COVID-19 pandemic and specifically pointing to JobKeeper, 
personal income tax and the job make a hiring credit have all assisted in getting us to where we are today. But again, Mr President, it is those small and family businesses out there, uh, the backbone Order. of the Senator Australian Cash, community. Time for the answer and has we say expired. Thank Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. Or, sorry, representing the Foreign Minister. Sorry, this question has been incorrect. I apologise. This question has been a, has a typo in it, and I apologise to the minister. My question is to the minister, to the Foreign Minister, Senator Payne. I apologise to the minister. Thank you. How many Australians are stranded overseas? and registered with the Department of Foreign Offence and Trade as wanting to return home. Senator, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Keenly, for her question. Uh, around 39,000 people overseas are registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and wish to return to Australia. Mr President, over 430,000 Australians have returned from overseas since the government recommended that Australians consider the, reconsider the need to travel overseas. Since March, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has supported over 32,700 Australians to return on over 500 flights. That includes over 11,200 people on 77 government-facilitated flights since March. A further 118 passengers landed in Hobart on Sunday from Delhi on a DFAT-facilitated flight with Qantas. Since the 23rd of October, DFAT has facilitated 13 flights with 1,847 passengers. Those numbers are, of course, constrained, Mr. President, by the capacity of quarantine availability in Australia uh, through the cap supplied by the states and territories and agreed by the National Cabinet. Further facilitated flights with Qantas are planned for Frankfurt, Chennai, Paris, London and Delhi. Since the 18th of September, when the Prime Minister spoke about uh, these matters, Mr. President, after National Cabinet, over 45,400 Australians have returned to Australia. That includes more than 17,500 Australians registered at that time with DFAT, and of these, Mr. President, over 3,800 were vulnerable. We continue to help those, Mr. President, who are vulnerable through our hardship uh, provisions, and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has distributed uh, significant funds uh, to a number of those Australians. Mr President, the Consular Division of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and our consul consular officers around the world are literally working with no exaggeration, no hyperbole, 24 hours, seven days a week to assist as many Australians as possible to return. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. How many of those currently stranded, of the 39,000 who are currently stranded, were registered with the DFAT on the 18th of September when Mr. Morrison promised to have them home by Christmas? Senator Payne. Um, Mr. President, I don't have the numbers broken down in that construct that Senator Keneally has asked about. Uh, as I said, since the 18th of September, over 45,400 Australians have returned to Australia. That includes more than 17,500 Australians registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, the process of supporting passengers, uh, supporting Australians, Mr. President, and organising flights means that in the last four weeks alone, we've made more than 30,000 offers of places on flights to Australians registered overseas. That's resulted in around 3,000 people taking up nearly all the seats available to us on relevant flights. There are Australians who are not able to accept flights that are being offered to them. There are Australians who uh, indicate they have multiple ties to the country they are in who are not able to depart immediately. Some airlines are being allocated additional Order. capacity Senator specifically Payne. for vulnerable Time Australians. Time the answer has expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. The minister has previously advised the Senate that 26,000 Australians were, were registered with DFAT on the 18th of September. If 17,000 have come home, that would suggest some 9,000 are still stranded on the day Mr. Uh, the Prime Minister made that promise. So, given today is the 10th of December, the last day for stranded Australians to land in Australia, quarantine for two weeks, and spend Christmas at home, what does the Minister have to say to those 9,000 stranded Australians who will be stranded overseas for Christmas as a result of Mr. Morrison's broken promise? Senator Payne. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. I absolutely reject Senator Keneally's characterisation uh, in her uh, in her question. Uh, then, since the 18th of September, Mr. President, over 45,400 Australians have returned to Australia, including more than 17,500 Australians registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And, Mr. President, today, tomorrow, and every day between now and the end of this year, and frankly into next year. We will continue to, in, to support Australians to take flights, particularly vulnerable Australians who we have supported on, on uh, facilitated flights. I indicated there are further flights planned for Frankfurt, Chennai, Paris, London and Delhi. Mr President, there is no denying that this is a very, very difficult situation, not just for Australians here but internationally, and the government Order. absolutely recognises that, Wong. Mr President. The government Senator, absolutely Senator recognises Wong. it is difficult for families, it is Order. difficult for Senator individuals, Payne, time for but the we are has working— expired. Order. Senator Wong, Senator Keneally, Senator Payne, time has expired. Before I come to you, Senator McKenzie, it has been drawn— Order. It's been drawn to my attention that we're joined today in my gallery by the family of the late former Senator Susan Ryan. And I know travel restrictions prevented many family members coming to a number of our condolence motions. So to Justine, Ben and Kate, welcome to the Senate. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. The increasing trade tensions with China are escalating the concern of Australian farmers and export-focused businesses and highlighting the need for Australia to secure our sovereignty and diversify our trading markets. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government have been growing our export opportunities for Australian businesses to drive the comeback from COVID-19? The order, order, we're nearly there. The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thank, th thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, and just on indulgence, can I again acknowledge uh, with the, the late Susan Ryan's family in the gallery the, uh, the enormous contribution that she made in a groundbreaking way to this nation. Mr. President, can I thank Senator McKenzie for her question. There is no stronger advocate for so many of Australia's exporting industries than Senator McKenzie. Uh, and indeed, I know full well how strongly she and all members on our side have championed the interests of our export industries in recent years. And in recent years, our government has succeeded in bringing into force more trade agreements that provide more opportunities for new markets than any other government in Australian history. The comprehensive and progressive agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership included new free trade agreements with markets of Canada and Mexico, and in doing so eliminated more than 98 per cent of tariffs across them. The Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement sees this year over 99 per cent of Australian goods exported by value entering duty-free or under significantly improved preferential access, a long sought-after agreement with Indonesia that we have secured and delivered. The Hong Kong Agreement guarantees all Australian goods enter duty-free. The Peru Agreement eliminates more than 99 per cent of tariffs by 2024. PACER Plus, I am pleased to say, Mr President, will enter into force this Sunday and will support our Pacific neighbours, particularly in their economic recovery from COVID-19. And these, of course, come on top of the trade agreements negotiated earlier in the life of our government with the three large North, North Asian countries of China, Korea and Japan. On Tuesday this week, we brought into force our world-leading digital economy agreement with Singapore, which improves regional digital trading conditions and makes it easier for exporters to do business. Meanwhile, Mr President, we have implemented some 26 of the actions under the 15-year India economic strategy uh, of our government, delivering opportunities in that market and in so many others for Australian Order, businesses Senator to Birmingham. grow. Birmingham. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister please outline what action Australia has either considered or is pursuing through the World Trade Organisation to stand up for Australian primary producers following the imposition by China of prohibitive tariff increases on Australian wine and barley? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. Indeed, I have expressed, as has our government, our deep dissatisfaction and concern with the actions of China in a number of areas disrupting trade uh, by Australian exporters into that market. We have, as a government, uh, used and stood by the rules-based international trading system 
uh, of, based around the World Trade Organisation. We have done so, Mr President, by initiating a dispute uh, with our friends in India on concerns about sugar subsidies. We indeed initiated a dispute with our friends in Canada in relation to wine subsidies. In that matter, we settled the arrangements with Canada on those wine issues following dialogue and discussion. And I emphasise, Mr President, that just because you get to the point of initiating a WTO dispute doesn't take dialogue off the table. The opportunity will always remain to do so, and whilst we consult and consider initiating such action against China in relation to Bali, we also would wish the Chinese government to come to the table and be willing, as Australia is, to Order. have that Senator dialogue Birmingham. and resolve these Time disagreements. The expired. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline what the Liberal and Nationals government is doing to create further export opportunities for Australian farmers and businesses? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, whilst having achieved many new market opportunities for Australian farmers and businesses, we have been relentless in seeking to create even more. During our time, we have grown the amount of Australian trade covered by preferential terms from some 26 per cent up to 70 per cent. Recently, we signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, providing more common rules of origin across the nations of our region, which will make it easier for both goods exporters as well as new opportunities for services exports across the region. We are actively continuing to negotiate with the United Kingdom and the European Union to secure trade agreements with those entities and economies, as well as with the Pacific Alliance countries of Colombia, Mexico, Peru and Chile. We are also re-engaging with India as part of our comprehensive strategic partnership arrangements with India on a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement, also building on a new economic cooperation program with Vietnam and our strategies to Order. pursue opportunities Senator with Birmingham. the market of Indonesia. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. What is the lowest hourly rate a young frontline supermarket worker could be paid under the Morrison government's industrial relations changes? And can the minister guarantee no young worker will be worse off as a result of the Morrison government's industrial relations changes? Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I don't have access with me to every award available to uh, workers in Australia, Mr. President. So order. Uh, I I will, have to, I will have to take on notice the award rates for uh, young people working in supermarkets, uh, Mr. President. Uh, but, Mr. President, the reforms Order. that we are seeking to bring in as a part of our industrial relations reform are about making everybody better off, Mr. President. About uh, business being better off about employees being better off and, of course, creating jobs so that the economy is better off, Mr President. So that is the focus of the legislation that we are bringing forward, Mr President, and, and that is why we work uh, every day uh, to, re to ensure that the, eco the, re the economy can recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have some, I think, quite sensible suggestions to put forward as a part of this package, Mr President. And as the, the Leader has said today in the Senate, uh, over 170 hours of consultation between the government and the unions with respect to developing a package of reforms, sensible industrial relations reforms, that can be presented to this country in the interests of all Australians, whether that be younger Australians, older Australians, whether that be uh, business and the economy more broadly, Mr President. We need to have the flexibility in the economy, in the, in the system, to be able to create new jobs, for industry to create new jobs uh, and to employ young Australians and old Australians alike, Mr President. That is the focus of the reforms that we are bringing forward, Mr President. Uh, we want everybody to be better off. We want young Australians at work to be better off. We want older Australians at work to be better off. We want business to be better off. And we clearly, Mr President, would like to see the, co the economy better off. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary uh, thank question. Thank you, Mr President. I note the minister won't guarantee that young workers will not be worse off. Can the minister guarantee a 61-year-old frontline aged care worker will not be worse off under the Morrison government's proposed industrial relations changes? And can the minister guarantee no older worker 
will be worse off as a result of the Morrison government's industrial relations changes. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And can I say the claims that have been made by the opposition with respect to aged care workers in the last couple of days, uh, the suggestion that they will uh, have a wage cut by Christmas is an absolute disgrace, yeah. given the hard work that aged care workers in particular have undertaken over the last 12 months. The suggestion that aged care workers are going to get a cut in their salaries by Christmas, Mr. President, is an absolute disgrace, Mr. President. Order, Senator. Order, Senator Wong is on her feet on my left. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, the word disgrace coming out of this minister's mouth is order. interesting, but my, my point, of, point order, of order is point direct of order. relevance. My point of order is direct relevance. He is asked a question about whether or not older workers will be worse off as a result of this government's changes. I ask him to return to that point. Um, I think while the people who ask the question may not, not like the terms in which it is answered, he is addressing the point raised in it, and there's an opportunity, I think, today after question time to debate it. So I call the minister to continue. He was being directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, thank you Mr. President. Order. Mr. President, the, the suggestion, the suggestion, Mr. Order, President, Senator that Wong. aged care workers are going to get a, uh, a wage cut for, for Christmas is wrong. Is wrong, Mr. President. It will not happen, and it's a disgrace, Mr. President, that the order. Labor Party has suggested. Senator Colbeck, um, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Point of order. It is the Morrison's government industrial relations changes about which Senator we are Wong. asking. I'm asking okay. him to return to that point, Mr. President. Oh, that was part of the question. I, I think, with respect, Senator Wong, I've allowed you to emphasise it. Um, he, is, he is talking about what I would consider to be the policy currently before the other place that is the subject of the question. There's 16 seconds remaining. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, and, and coming from this party, who at the last election specifically ruled out an increase in wages order. for aged care workers, order. Mr. President. Senator, uh, what I will say is. A phrase in response to a pointed question can still not. Um, I'll, I'll hear your submission, Senator, Senator Wong. Yep. Mr. President, how can what this party may or may not have done prior to the last election possibly be directly relevant under the standing orders to a question which goes to the effect of this government's proposed industrial relations changes? If you say it's order. not going to happen, guarantee Senator it. Senator Wong, Senator Birmingham. President, on the point of order, and I've, I've almost lost count of the number of points of order that Senator Wong has chosen to take in interrupting Senator Colbeck. But on the, on the point of order, Senator Colbeck, in responding to this question, has spoken very clearly about aged care workers, the wages of aged care workers, the wage arrangements for aged care workers, and the points, the repetitive points of order from those opposite, now seeking to take one sentence out of a two-minute answer that has overwhelmingly been directly relevant. It's simply an abuse of the procedures and the standing orders. On the point of order, I order. On the point of order, I have ruled previously. A glancing phrase in an answer is not going to make someone not directly relevant. An answer that consisted of attacking the opposition or outlining their policy would not be directly relevant. That said. I do grant some latitude to the Leader of the Opposition in making points of order, and I think I do need to allow the Minister, when points of order are made and partial parts of the questions are restated, um, the Minister can use a glancing phrase in response to that. He did, at the end of that, in my view, turn back to the answer because he was then talking about the wages of these particular workers. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and, and the intention of the reforms that are being proposed, Mr. President, as I've said before, are to make Order, people better. Senator off. Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. Order, Senator Gallagher is on her feet. Senator O'Neill, Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Given the minister has demonstrated a failure to answer simple questions across your portfolio areas, will this be his last time, question time as a minister in this place? Senator Colbeck. Order. Order on my left. Thank you, thank you Mr Order. President. Can I, can I say uh, uh, I look forward to continuing to do my work within this portfolio. I know that all of us, all of us on the front bench, Mr President, all of us 
on the front bench serve at the pleasure of the Prime Minister, and I respect that enormously, Mr. President. I look Order. forward to continuing to do my work. But one thing I do know, Mr. President, and one thing that gives me great satisfaction: whatever happens in the reshuffle, whatever happens in the reshuffle when it comes, that lot will still be on the other side. Order, order, Senator Davey. Thank you, well, Mr. Senator President. Senator Davey's on her feet. And order. I on my right on this occasion, Senator Davey. That was a, that was a good response, though. Um, my, que <laughs> my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Minister, could you please outline how the Liberals and the Nationals in government are supporting our agricultural sector through the recent natural disasters, bushfire, drought and now COVID and the COVID recession? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator Davey for, for her question and also her long-standing interest in all things agriculture. Well, the Australian agricultural industry has a proud history of overcoming adversity. Um, and I think you know, if you look at strength in the face of adversity, you don't have to look much further than uh, the subject of Senator McKenzie's uh, recently launched book, Blackjack McEwen, uh, which was launched today. Um, and you know, like previous governments, previous Conservative governments, the Morrison government will continue to back our agricultural sector. Um, we'll back them through droughts. We'll back them through floods. We'll back them through bushfires. And this year, we have backed them through the coronavirus pandemic by committing to them drought support, ten billion dollars. Senator Wilson on a point of order. Oh. Of order about the prop on Senator McKenzie's desk. I didn't see that. If, if, if senators want to read Senator, a good book, I'd recommend Senator, Senator McKenzie's book. Um, a Secret Australia. Order. A Secret Sit Australia. Sit down, by everyone. We've nearly made it. Just everyone bite their tongues for four more minutes. Senator McKenzie, I am going to ask you to. Um, reading material of that matter would not be in order in the chamber anyway, I understand. So um, I, I think it probably needs to be placed in your drawer or a folder. Senator Rustin. Um, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. President. Um, and, and as I was saying, um, the, the Conservative governments um, over the years have been, had a very proud relationship with our agricultural sector, um, and this government is no exception. And we'll stand side by side with our farming sector um, through tough times uh, to make sure that we continue to roll out programs uh, that will support the huge contribution that the Australian yeah. agricultural yeah. sector makes to our economy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just as an example, you know, through the coronavirus pandemic, the government announced a $328 million busting congestion for agricultural exporters package to grow our food and fibre exports. Um, from day one of the pandemic, the, ga the government recognised the pivotal role that agriculture would play and particularly the pivotal role that agriculture will play in the economic recovery. Um, we've made sure not just to look after the agricultural sector itself, but to make sure that we're, our supply chains remain open and safe, making sure that our access to the rest of the world remains in place. By, for instance, addressing the air freight shortages and the disrupted supply chains overseas through the international freight assistance mechanism put in place by Senator Birmingham. We stand side by side Order, with Senator our Rustin. Farmers. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. And um, as you've described, the past 12 months have been incredibly challenging. Can you please tell the chamber how our agricultural industry has performed in the last 12 months, despite the challenges they've faced? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and, and once again, um, thank you, Senator Davey, for uh, the opportunity you have to, to say what a great industry Australian agriculture is, and to acknowledge the fact that, despite the headwinds that this industry has been experiencing over recent times, um, it remains an industry with a great ability to thrive under adversity. Um, in fact, on Monday, the Australian Bureau of Agricultural Resource Economics it revised its outlook for agricultural output in 2021. Um, the gross value of agricultural production is forecast to rise by 7 per cent to $65 billion uh, this year. And given we've had droughts, given we've had fires, given we've had the coronavirus pandemic, this is an outstanding result. And it is an absolute testament 
to the resilience of our Australian agricultural sector, and this government, the Morrison government, will stand side by side our farmers to make sure we work with them to achieve $100 billion worth Order, of agriculture. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Finally, Minister, as we head into the busy Christmas holiday season, and I wish all of my farmers in harvest at the moment a happy harvest, how can we Australians continue to support our farmers and our regional communities? Senator Rustin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much much, Mr President. Um, well, as we all know in this place, there will be no argument from anybody in this place. Australia produces the best food and fibre in the world, and that's why our food and fibre commands the premium prices that it does. It's not only clean and green, it's sustainably grown and it's produced ethically. So this festive season, I'd urge everybody in this place and everybody watching, because I'm sure the whole of Australia is watching Question Time today, to buy local. And if you can, have a look. Make sure that that little green and gold icon that says Made in Australia is at the forefront of your mind when you're purchasing your Christmas presents or your food to share with loved ones over Christmas. Could be apricots from my hometown in the Riverland. Um, you know, it could be mangoes from the Northern Territory that you want to make to put on the top of the pav. Or in the case of, uh, of, uh, of our colleague from the Northern Territory, maybe make a mango daiquiri out of it. Prawns from Cost Harbour, Morton Bay bugs. There are so many amazing Australian products that you could be putting on the table this Christmas. Order, urge you to time buy Australian. For the... oh, oh, Senator, no. Senator Polly. Thank you, Mr. President. My question. My question is to Order. the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Order Senator Colbeck. Order on my left. Senator Polly. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians. This year, 2,000 aged care residents contracted COVID-19, and tragedy struck 685 people who died under this minister's watch in residential care. Why has the minister not resigned? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, actually, Senator Polly is not correct with the number of people who have died uh, as a result of COVID attack to, to uh, aged care. It's uh, 693. Um, there are eight who have been receiving home care packages that um, have, uh, have also tragically passed away, Mr. President. And, and to each one of those 693 families and, uh, and their communities, uh, I extend my sincerest condolences and the condolences of the government. It's a tragedy that we've had to suffer, the pandemic that we have this year, Mr President. Uh, and I think as we come to Christmas, it is uh, a pertinent thing for us to do just to reflect on the year that we've had, uh, to reflect on the tragedy that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought upon us, upon us all, uh, and again to extend our condolences, our sincere condolences to all of those families who uh, have suffered a death because of the uh, effects of the pandemic, Mr President. Uh, as I said when I was asked uh, about my position earlier, I will continue uh, to work at the pleasure of the Prime Minister. Uh, I acknowledge with respect to uh, my portfolio responsibilities, so I take my role in this place and in my portfolio extremely seriously. Uh, we are in the middle of a uh, very significant reform process. I look forward to the final report of the Royal Commission, which is due on the 26th of February, uh, and I continue to work uh, with my department and my colleagues on the reforms that we will bring to this place off the back of the Royal Commission report, Mr President. Uh, so I continue to apply myself to the role, uh, which is the responsibility that the Prime Minister has given me, uh, and I will continue to do that, uh, Mr President, uh, for hopefully uh, through uh, the process that we'll go through uh, with the reshuffle, Mr President. Senator uh, Polly, a supplementary question. In the Morrison government's broken aged care system, we heard shocking stories of ants crawling from wounds and older Australians not dying of COVID-19, but of neglect. Is the minister confident he will remain in the portfolio at the end of this month? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, uh, my role in the, I, I take my position in this extremely seriously, and quite frankly, none of this that we're dealing with is about me. 
the, 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 thing that's in my, the thing that is in my focus, Mr. President, the thing that is in my focus is that 1.2 million Australians who are receiving care, whether that be CHSP, home care, uh, veterans care or uh, residential aged care, uh, as a part of the service delivery provided by aged care providers around the country. It, they are my focus. This is not about me. This is not about me. Uh, and, and I will continue to have and place my focus on all of those Australians who are receiving care. That is my responsibility. Uh, and I will continue to do that assiduously while ever I hold this wrong. Senator Polly, a final supplementary question. Under this minister's watch, there was no dedicated plan for COVID-19 in aged care. Tens of thousands were attacked and assaulted in his broken aged care system. Ants crawled from wounds. 693 older Australians in residential aged care died. And as a result, the Senate censured this minister. Will this be your last appearance in question time as Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians? Because it should be. Order. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, thank you Mr President. Mr. Mr. President, uh, this government has never pretended. This government has never pretended that everything was all well with the Order. aged care system, Mr. President. Because we, it, it was this government, Mr. President, it was this Senator government that called the Royal Commission into aged care, Mr. President. It was this government. Senator Green. And Mr. Mr. President, the report, the, the, the interim report of the Aged Care Royal Commission reflected on over 20 years across a number of governments of both political persuasions about the impact and, and the progression of the aged care sector, Mr President. So it was this government that took the responsibility to call the Royal Commission. And, 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 and it is this government that will respond to it, Mr President. But this opposition, Mr President, has at every opportunity failed to act. Including in the in the budget and reply, where not a single cent or home care package was allocated. And Mr. President, as I said before, whatever happens at the at the reshuffle, this lot will still Order. be on the other side. Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. And uh, and as uh, so many books were waved around during question time, I'm very excited to uh, to be able to table. Um, for the Senate, uh, the ACCC's report into the Perishable Agricultural Goods Inquiry, which I'm sure Thank will you. be a thrilling read for um, all. Senators, could I, I also would like to order, I'd just like to table a determination made by the Speaker and myself made under the Parliamentary Service Act 1999 relating to the appointment of the Secretary of the Department of Parliamentary Services. Are there any motions to take note of answers? We've got the list today. Um, Senator Watt, I don't believe your microphone is on. I don't need it. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. How many times this year have we heard the phrase, we're all in this together? Over the last few months, we've heard that countless times from the Prime Minister and every one of the members of his team, that no matter what walk of life we were in through COVID-19 and through the recovery, we were told that we were all in this together. And what that's meant when it has been applied honestly by this government, is that we have looked out for each other, that all of us are thankful to the essential workers who've kept us safe, who've kept us healthy, who's kept us fed. The retail workers, the truckies who've been delivering goods for supermarkets, the health workers, the cleaners, the aged care workers, the childcare workers, the people who've actually kept this country moving and functioning over the last few months. We've all supported them as they have supported us, and that's why Australia has done comparatively well compared to the rest of the world. So it's really quite tragic that as we end this year, we see how this Prime Minister repays those essential workers with a Christmas pay cut. What a way to thank those essential workers who've kept us safe, who've kept us fed, who have kept us healthy, 
to end the year by saying to them that as we turn the page into the new year and as we supposedly recover from this worst recession we've seen since the Great Depression, that what they have to look forward to in the next year is a pay cut and no change whatsoever to the other problems they face in the workplace, such as the rampant casualisation we've seen under this government. And we knew this was true because yesterday we saw this government revert to its true colours. And it was very interesting watching Question Time today because I often notice how glum, dejected, not interested uh, the backbench of this government look uh, through Question Time. But today they were more animated than ever when we started talking about cutting workers' pay. Because that is the thing to which Liberal and national politicians are magnetically drawn. That is the thing that so many people on the government side of this chamber got elected to office to do, was to smash unions, cut workers' pay, remove conditions under the guise of some bizarre neoliberal economic mumbo-jumbo that says that you increase demand in the economy by giving people less money to spend. That is the economic philosophy of this government. We see it over and over again by them deciding to withdraw JobKeeper payments and reduce JobKeeper payments, by reducing JobSeeker payments, by doing all sorts of other things to take money out of the economy at a time when we need to be stimulating it. And they've got even more in store for the average worker next year when they say that they will be able to be paid less and have other conditions taken away from them. They'll be able to have penalty rates taken off them. They'll be able to be forced to work more hours without overtime. That is obviously terrible for those workers that they have money taken out of their pockets, but it's also terrible for the economy because we know that what we need right now to get this economy functioning better uh, and creating more jobs is more money in more people's pockets. But what this will do is take money out of the pockets of average working families and put it into businesses instead. That's not going to help any of those families and it's certainly not going to help the economy grow next year. Now, we saw the answers from Senator Birmingham yesterday where he was given repeated opportunities to rule out uh, the proposition that workers will be worse off as a result of these changes and repeatedly he refused to take that opportunity. I was actually doing a bit of research today to see what government members have said about the better off overall test in the past. And I noticed that in 2012, when Senator Abetz was the employment minister, uh, before the, before the um, uh, Abbott government was first elected, uh, he talked about the IR changes that they were proposing to bring in. And he said uh, that under an Abbott government, no worker would be worse off. Now, we all know that wasn't true, but we can't even get that kind of a, an admission or a claim out of ministers now, and that's because they know in their hearts that workers will be worse off as a result of these changes. And what's more, for all the reports that we saw this morning that the government was walking away from these reforms, what we know from Question Time today is it's full Thank stem you, ahead. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you, um, Acting. Uh, not acting. Sorry. Thank you, Deputy President. Look, this is so typical of Labor, um, and it's really unfair of Labor at this time of year, as we are getting to Christmas, and as people are doing extra hours um, and working hard, and as confidence is finally starting to build again. Finally, we are regaining confidence. Labor has to throw the scare tactics out, has to threaten to everyone and say, the government's going to cut your pay. The big bad boogeyman of government's going to come out and cut your pay. And there can be nothing further from the truth. Because let me tell you, Acting President, uh, Deputy President, let me tell you, the government does not set pay rates. The government does not set pay rates. And enterprise bargaining is not done by the government. Enterprise bargaining is done by the unions with their employers, and then it is taken to the Independent Fair Work Commission. So this is not the government cutting pay. This is the unions and their employers 
and their employees sitting down around the table negotiating. And where they determine that a business would be better off addressing recovering from COVID, then they can negotiate an outcome which then is taken to the Independent Fair Work Commission. And then the Independent Fair Work Commission has to run their lens over it. And remember, the Independent Fair Work Commission cannot accept changes that go against the public interest. Now, of course, we don't want to see any more workers lose their jobs. In fact, we want more jobs. We want to create jobs because we are a government that backs jobs. But to back jobs, we have to back the employers that make those jobs. So that's what we're doing here. We have recognised that COVID has had a shocking impact on the economy. And we are putting in place changes that allow employees and employers to negotiate a way out that is adjudicated by an independent body in the Fair Work Commission. Just as has been the case always under Labor's Fair Work Act ever since 2009, any agreements that are approved can only be in place for a maximum of two years. Now That gives businesses time to recover from COVID, make the adjustments that they need to make. So I, I say again, it is absolutely deplorable that Labor claims that people are going to get their pays cut. They are not going to get pay cuts unless they negotiate for a pay cut through their enter enterprise bargaining arrangements. Look, and the other thing that Labor aren't talking about is the security that this creates, what we are doing to address the issues for casual workers. We are providing mechanisms that allow casual workers a pathway to transition into full-time roles. Where is the negative aspects in that? This is a good thing for casuals. Labor's always claiming that casuals are the hard done by people. Well, we are trying to improve things for casual workers. And we're also making sure that we leg legislate what a clear definition of casual is to give casual workers certainty, to give them certainty which will provide legal Order. certainty over their role <laughs> so they can't be switched off and on like a light switch. So if they prefer things like annual leave and long service leave rather than getting the higher hourly rate that is given to casual workers, they'll be able to make that transition to a permanent full-time role. So that's a good thing. I, I struggle to see why Labor are so fundamentally against policies that actually deliver on what Labor claims to be standing for. We are the party for jobs. We are the party for business and we will continue to back employees and employers and get Australians working again, because that is the best way our nation can pull together to recover from the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davies. Um, Senator Polly. <laughs> One thing is for sure, Australian workers have certainty in knowing that this government is a lazy, sloppy government who don't consult but they always know that when push comes to shove, in their DNA is their attack on workers' rights, their conditions. All they want to see is the big end of town and their business mates to be able to casualise more and more of our workforce. That's what they're about, taking away their protection, allowing people to work part-time without any uh, uh, penalty rates uh, that they can rely on, and this is the government's Christmas present to Australian workers. You know, uh, my colleague Senator Watts uh, started his contribution with the phrase, we're all in this together, and that was the mantra that was repeated in the media, in this chamber, in the other place repeatedly during the pandemic. Well, this is no way, no way to repay Australian workers, particularly those who worked on the front line to keep us safe. 
Those who worked in our supermarkets day in, day out to ensure we had our essential services. The supermarket workers, the truck drivers, the delivery drivers, those uh, teachers, those childcare workers, aged care staff, and so many of those are casualised jobs, certainly in retail, supermarket, hospitality. These are the people that this government want to take away their pay cut. That's what these people want to do. It is in their DNA. It's what they resort to time and time again. Now, we have always said we're happy to talk and to have a dialogue between industrial relations reform that's going to give more security to Australian workers. That's what we will do. But there's one thing you can count on from this side of the chamber, and that is we will fight every single day for better pay, better conditions for Australian workers. What you are trying to do now is bring in work choices, mark two, which is what you do whenever you're in trouble. That's what you do because you have no real plan for this economy and for jobs. So what do you go to? The lowest common denominator, attack workers. Attack their pays, attack their penalty rates, keep them casualised, underemployed, because that's what you do best. You ha are, would have to be the most unfair, callous government that this country has seen <coughs> for a very, very long time. And as I said, if you were really concerned, really concerned about people's jobs, why are you cutting JobKeeper? If you're concerned about your government's impact on Australian workers and for those people who are looking for work, for the job seekers out there, you wouldn't be cutting their money either, putting them back into poverty. So don't come into this place trying to rewrite history as you do time and time again. Do something for Australian workers to secure their employment. Australian workers have had a tough year, as has the rest of the community in terms of the pandemic. But even before COVID-19, the economy was not travelling very well. We had massive uh, underemployment in this country. We had high underemployment. And in my home state of Tasmania, the unemployment rate is the highest in the country. And your reforms will do nothing whatsoever for their families and those workers. It's not good for our economy to cut workers' wages. It's bad for our economy. It's bad for Australian workers. It's bad for their families. And we will <laughs> fight every single day for your industrial reforms, which is going to make life harder for those workers, cause greater casualisation of the workforce, continue the underemployment in this country and put added pressure on, on our families, workers' families in this country, and we will fight your ideology, your, your DNA, your attack on workers each and every day. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President, and what a time to be alive. Never before have we faced the difference between the forces of darkness and the forces of light. And on this side of the chamber, we are the forces of light taking on the force of darkness here. And what will guide our light is evidence. What will guide us to the light is evidence. Now, last week, I put up a motion that said that all hypotheses and theories must be backed up by recorded evidence, by recorded evidence, and I pushed back on indoctrination, intimidation, and shoddy mathematical modelling. And what we have seen today here is absolute indoctrination of lies, nothing but unfounded lies. So let me shine some light on the truth, because this side of the chamber will always stand up Order. for facts and will never accept the post-fact world that this side of the chamber is trying to lead us to. Order. So let's talk about the facts. If you hop on the Order. Fair Work, if you hop on the Fair Work uh, uh, site, you will see that under the coalition government, 
uh, take-home uh, pay for people working between 6 o'clock and 9 o'clock on weeknights is rising from 130 per cent penalty rate to 150 per cent penalty rate. That is a fact. You will see that on Saturdays penalty rates are increasing from 140 per cent to 150 per cent. That is a fact. And let me go on about some more facts that Labor, Labor and their former leader, uh, the member for Mary Bong, Bill Shorten. Let's talk about what he did. As the, what if, sorry, apologies. Um, uh, as National Secretary of the AWU, Bill Shorten cut penalty rates for some of our lowest paid workers. Under the infamous clean event deal in 2006, he stripped workers of all penalty rates with no compensation. No compensation. And because of the deals done by Bill Shorten's mates, a 24-year-old uni student who started weekend work at McDonald's, a foreign multinational, mind you, would now be about $15,000 worse off. And there's more, Madam Deputy Secretary. When Mr Shorten was National Secretary of the AWU, AWU he struck a deal with Target that paid workers $47.91 a week less, <laughs> or almost $2,500 a year, than the Retail Industry Award. That's right, Madam Deputy President. Ding, ding, ding. Under Labor, people get paid less. People get paid less. But there's more. Uh, we've got Bill Shorten's grubby deal with Chiquita. Uh, in a grubby deal in 2004, 157 mushroom pickers lost their jobs. 120 workers suffered wage reductions, but the AWU and Mr Shorten, the Secretary at the time, received $25,000 in secret payments and $4,000 a month in union fees. This grubby deal makes work choices look generous to the downtrodden. For those who will demand the smoking gun to substantiate these claims, be advised that there is an entire armoury contained in the transcripts and sworn evidence from the Commission on Sep... Uh, uh, oh, no, no. And then we go to another one. We go uh, uh, a Fairfax media investigation. I mean, Fairfax and no friends of ours has uncovered large payments from joint uh, venture builder T. John Holden to the AWU when Mr. Shorten ran the union. One of Australia's biggest builders paid Bill Shorten's union nearly $300,000 as he after he struck a workplace deal that cut conditions and saved the company as much as $100 million on a major Melbourne road project. And there's more. It's not just uh, Mr Shorten. Morris Blackburn, Morris Blackburn uh, one of the, uh, Australia's leading industrial law firms, couldn't themselves actually pay staff properly. They undercut staff payments by a million dollars. Now, if that doesn't suggest, that doesn't suggest that the industrial relations laws in this country need reform when an industrial relations law firm that I might add Senator Watt and Senator Green work for, nothing to see here, actually underpaid the workers. But it gets worse, Madam Deputy President, because the, uh, voice, uh, the uh, propaganda machine for the Labor Party, the ABC, also uh, underpaid nearly 2,000 staff. Great, great auntie also underpaid 2,000 staff. And let me just wrap this up by saying that this election is not over in the states. 17 states have just sued the other states, and we will see who is leader of the free world come back next year. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Ayres. Well, the problem um, with following Senator Rennick um, is that it sort of um, does derail one trains, one's train of thought, doesn't it? The um, 2020 has been a hard year for many Australians. Uh, and you would think that for the cleaners and nurses and truckies, public transport workers, retail workers, public servants, people in aged care, that the government would have come to this parliament with an agenda that was about making jobs good jobs, about decent wages and wage growth about growth in the economy and doing something to give Australian families some confidence in their future. But instead, the Morrison government has done what every Liberal government has done uh, since John Howard and has gone the low road. Their biggest ambition for the economy is to go back to the pre-COVID economy. This time last year—don't forget what the pre-COVID economy was like—this time last year, 1.8 million people underemployed 
are unemployed. This year, 2.4 million people underemployed are unemployed. Last year, 5.3 per cent unemployment. No great achievement. This year, 7 per cent, heading towards 8 per cent. The investment share of GDP, the investment share of GDP is at its lowest level since 1959. The profit share of income at its highest level in recorded history, the wage share of income the lowest since 1964. Spending anemic then, catastrophic now. And last year, don't forget that the last thing that the government did in this parliament last year was try and ram the Ensuring Integrity Bill through, and they failed spectacularly. This year, they've got a new industrial relations bill. Different format, different structure, same purpose. They should have a plan for the economy, for jobs, for productivity and growth, but they have got no ambition for the economy, no ambition for the country. It's a backtrack from snapback, but now it's this loaded, our comeback, that fundamentally only will deliver an advertising-led recovery. It's all about big dollars shamefully and corruptly funnelled to Liberal Party mates in order to deliver future research and future advertising down the track. Now, you'd wonder what else is in store. And it makes me consider the position of people in regional Australia, where there are 28 unemployed people for every job. And what has been the contribution of the National Party, the junior partner in this coalition, the dregs of the squatter class, what remains of the Bunyip aristocracy, what are they contributing to this vision for the country? So disconnected, so disconnected, the only thing they are focused on here is the leadership of the National Party. So disconnected, Mr Littleproud, his contribution this year is to claim that strawberry pickers get paid $3,800 a week on a good day. Well, it would be a very good day. Nothing for regional jobs. Now, I saw Senator Canavan on Sky the other night saying that the cashless debit card should be extended to every Australian on welfare. So disconnected, so remote. So I took the opportunity to have a look at Senator Canavan's Twitter profile. And lo and behold, he's changed his photo. Now, I couldn't adequately describe it for the Senate. Senator so I Ayers. thought I'd bring it in here. Senator Ayres, it's not there appropriate. It is. Senator Ayres. There it is. Thank you. Now that I am reliably informed, I mean more makeup than Ziggy Stardust in this photo. <laughs> he looks like one of the chimney sweeps from Oliver Twist. I am reliably informed that that effect on one's face can only be achieved with the application of Estee Lauder double wear infinite waterproof uh, eyeliner. Senator Ayres, please resume it's your uh, seat. And, and requires... Senator Ayres, please resume your seat. Senator Dunham. Deputy President, uh, just a uh, point of order on relevance. I think I understand the take note is on IR. Yes. We seem to be talking about cosmetics. Yes. I'm not quite sure how these things are related. I wonder, Madam Deputy President, if you could draw Senator Ayres back to the matter we're discussing. Well, I, I will inform you, Senator Dunham, uh, Senator Ayres has been mostly relevant. He's got 24 seconds uh, left, and as you say, it is a broad ranging. Uh, debate. So uh, we'll see where he goes in the next 24 uh -huh. seconds. But he has mostly uh, he has mostly focused on IR. Uh -huh. This bloke this bloke dresses up as a blue collar worker. Uh, th this former productivity commission economist maybe is the real thing. Maybe he was born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. <laughs> maybe it's Maybelline. <laughs> and and if any of you if any of you want to achieve the same effect. Don't skimp because you're worth it. Thank you, Senator Ayres. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, yeah. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Rice. Deputy President, um, I move to take note of the answer that Minister Payne gave to me to my question about Julian Assange. 
And sadly, the answers she gave me were well, they were tragic, really. The fact that Minister, Minister Payne and this government refuses to recognise the desperate situation of Julian Assange and refuses to recognise that it's much more than a consular case. It requires diplomatic and political engagement. I was also just struck and shocked by her callous disregard to the threats to Mr Assange's health due to, due to the risks from COVID, and this on International Human Rights Day. I mean, it is tragic on International Human Rights Day to see the minister refusing to recognise or to defend Julian Assange's human rights, an Australian citizen, and to provide him with the support that he deserves. So, look, and as I was reflecting on this topic in, topic in preparing my question today and then in responding to the minister, I actually really want to particularly acknowledge an important book that has been published on Julian Assange, A Secret Australia Revealed by the WikiLeaks Exposés, where 18 different Australians reflect on what Australia has learnt about itself from the work of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. And it's very relevant with the minister's response to my question today. It includes contributions from many people, including from Julian Assange's lawyer, Jennifer Robinson. And she notes in her contribution that the only reason Assange remains in prison is because of the US extradition request and their indictment, which the Freedom of the Press Foundation has described as a terrifying threat to press freedom. His indictment has been unanimously denounced by journalist unions and free speech and human rights organisations. And still, Australia takes no action. The Australian government claims it is offering consular assistance, but this unprecedented case requires more. It requires diplomatic and political action, which was exactly the question and the point that I was putting to Minister Payne today. I also I think it is very relevant the contribution in this book from my former colleague, um, former Senator Scott Lud Ludlam, and in his chapter entitled Free Julian Estage, Scott writes, the WikiLeaks publications have taught us two things about how power works in the increasingly uncomfortable West. There is the raw material itself, a meticulously indexed and utterly damning archive of great power, malevolence and manipulation. And then there is the reaction, how our own government has dealt with an inconvenient publisher. It looks different to how they do it in Israel, North Korea and Russia, but the outcome is the same. They have sought to destroy the messenger, not just as punishment, but as a warning to all other messengers. And every authoritarian since the beginning of time has known that repression has a habit of provoking anger and defiance instead. The choice is entirely on us. Fear is a natural reaction when we realise our governments will destroy us without hesitation if it serves their interests. And feeling that, understanding it in the same way that incarcerated refugees understand it, that First Nations peoples understand it, is what can bring us to that moment of defiance and anger. Know then that none of us are alone in this, that the anger is shared and widespread and growing. I mean, this is a rallying cry that rings true to me. And on reflecting on Human Rights Day today and Minister Payne's appalling response to the question of the human rights of Julian Assange, we recognise that there is so much more to be done for human rights here in Australia and internationally. I mean, domestically, on top of our inaction on truth and justice and treaties with our First Nations peoples, is, of course, our incarceration of refugees and asylum seekers, both on and offshore. So we must fight to continue to ensure that in, in Australia, all Australians have fundamental human rights and are entitled to the equal protection of the law. And we must passionately and consistently and ceaselessly highlight attacks on human rights wherever they occur and affirm our solidarity with people who are working to uphold human rights in the face of authoritarian, authoritarianism and dictatorships. And I really actually want to conclude by mentioning the case of Idris Khattak, who is a prominent human rights defender in Pakistan. It's been more than a year since he was abducted. 
and it took six months before the Pakistani Ministry of Defence to even acknowledge that they had him in, in custody. Now, I, want to, I want to call on the government of Pakistan to ensure that his rights are protected, his safety is guaranteed and he be returned to his family as soon as possible. International Human Rights Day is a time to be looking at the human rights of everyone, from people like Julian Assange to people being oppressed right across the world. And it's something that we need to continue. Thank you, Senator Rice. Your time has continue. expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Rice to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I'll just um, draw to the attention of senators in the chamber. We've got three committee reports listed on the notice paper and another three that have just been listed. So it's my intention to go through the three. Uh, let me finish, thanks, Senator Rice. Um, to go through the three and then whatever we've got left over we'll put uh, just before we get to 4 p.m. so that they're actually on the notice paper. Senator Rice. Uh, you need leave, so is okay, leave. I take leave to table a non conforming Is petition. leave granted? It's one I've been talking about in which. <laughs> yes, I believe leave is granted. Thank right. you, Senator Rice. Thank you. Um, so we